Hey everyone, welcome back to another build log documenting my attempt to build a DIY and open source version of the Dyson Solar Cycle Lamp, or what I call the DIY Sin. In the last build log, I fixed some critical electronics issues that were causing the lamp to whine and flicker. And with the electronics working just about perfectly, I'm moving on to a big mechanical issue and the last major hurdle in the DIY Sin project that I know of. Embedded within each of the DIY Sin's rails is a super track, a long PCB with exposed traces that transfers power up from the base through the carriage and to the LED electronics. A pair of pogo pin assemblies mounted to the carriage slide across these traces, maintaining a connection regardless of the lamp's position, and completely eliminates the need for long and unruly power cables. Perfect alignment of the pogo pins is essential for all of this to work. There's some built-in compensation for lateral movement from the spring-loaded pogo pins, but when movement occurs perpendicular to the pogo pin direction, there's a big problem. Unfortunately, this isn't a rare occurrence. I've found that the type of movement that pulls the arm away from the pogo pins happens regularly in day-to-day -day use. The pins lose contact with the super track traces, and even with the help of a small capacitor, power to the lamp is cut off, and the microcontroller reboots. I think there are a couple of overlapping causes behind this. Specifically, when the arm and the carriage move independently, the lamp stops working. When I think about the problem that way, I'm drawn to solutions that focus on restricting that movement or adding rigidity to the system to eliminate the movement because when movement happens, the lamp stops working. And when thinking in those terms, one solution comes to mind, which is uh, go back to this. This is the machined aluminum carriage that Jake made for me. And this is kind of the answer to that problem. If we want to eliminate movement, we need to add rigidity and changing materials from printed PLA to machined aluminum is a great way of doing that. The problem is that requiring a CNC aluminum carriage locks us in to a expensive, time-consuming, inaccessible process just to make the DIY sin. And from the beginning, my goal with this project was to make it accessible to as many people as possible, to make it so that you can not only print your own DIY sin and assemble it yourself, but if you want to riff on the carriage and change it a little bit, you can mock that up yourself, print off a new carriage, reassemble it, and test it out. It's pretty much a hard constraint on this project that it stays 3D printable and it stays accessible and it stays open source. But that's not the only way to add rigidity. Looking at this carriage, I think there are a couple of ways that we can optimize wheel placement to add rigidity just through optimization, not through material changing. And I ended up going through that process. So I printed this new carriage um, that is a little bit different from this carriage. I'm moving the wheels around strategically so that um, when the arm rotates, it has more support and so that the point of rotation is closer to the pogo pins, and the idea is that that should result in a reduced range of motion for the pogo pins. And turns out that this works pretty well. Not only is the motion greatly reduced, but when there is motion, both the arm and the carriage are rotating identically, and so that means there's not going to be a misalignment between the pogos and the super track. But in order to achieve this wheel placement, I had to shift around things a lot. And I think all in all, these adjustments are fairly minor. But if you think back to when I was designing this carriage, I went through this process where I was coming from the version before this, and I was bothered by the lack of intentionality in that carriage. The placement of every component on the carriage should be rational or self-explanatory. And I personally believe that I've achieved that with this carriage up uh, to the extent that I can. And looking at this, I, I don't hate this carriage. I, I actually think it looks kind of cool in like a utilitarian way. And I do think the placement of the wheels and the mounting points is defensible, but I just, I just don't, I don't get the same feeling from this that I get from this. This, I feel like, yes, it stands on its own. It doesn't need explanation. It doesn't, there's no compromises with this. This, even though I think it's an improvement over the old carriage designs, it's still a step backwards in that it's just not, it doesn't feel intentional. And for me, I don't want to go this direction unless I have to. If I have to go this direction, if it's the only solution, I'm totally okay with that. Like, I think it looks kind of cool. Same with the, uh, machined aluminum carriage. Um, I love this carriage. If I have to go with this, if this is the only way to get the DIYs in working, I'm gonna do it. But I don't think we have to. I think there's another option. These two solutions are focused on a problem statement that I think is incomplete. The problem statement sounds something like when the when components on the DIYs in move, uh, the lamp stops working. And 
they try to eliminate that movement and therefore keep the lamp working. But I think it misses a critical portion of the actual problem statement, which is something like when components on the lamp move and the systems of the lamp can't accommodate for that movement, the, the DIY system stops working. And you can focus on the first part and eliminate the movement, or I think we can focus on the second part and accommodate for that movement. And to me, it's kind of like the Bruce Lee approach to things, like just accept the situation, accept the constraints around you, and rather than resisting them, just adapt to them. I think what I can do is just modify the pogo pen assembly uh, that is mounted to the carriage and keep it mounted to the carriage but change it just a little bit so that its position isn't dictated by the carriage it's dictated by the arm so that when the arm moves the position of the pogo pen assembly can move just slightly and i'll do that just by modifying this uh, pogo pen assembly a little bit i'm going to add these tabs on top and bottom so that they hug the top and bottom of the rail and i think that should be enough to just guide the pogo pen assembly around and keep it in place. Um, I had a lot of like fantastical ideas for how this might work that involved like springs and rods and strange mounting systems, but I think it's probably best just to keep this simple. And um, it turns out that this simple approach of just hugging the rails with a bit of extra material works really well. We can replicate the movement from before and see that rather than losing contact, the pins just shift around with the rail. And not only does it solve our current problem, uh, but it also adds like a flexibility and a redundancy to the DIYs and overall so that later down the line, if you were to upgrade to an aluminum carriage, there's no reason why you couldn't add this little bit to the carriage. And then you'd have a setup that eliminates maybe 95% of the movement, but for the other 5%, you have a lot of redundancy uh, built in so that the lamp essentially never fails. And that's really exciting to me. I have done uh, some initial testing with this that it looks really promising. The alignment looks really good, but I need to do a long-term test to know if this is going to work or if it needs a redesign or if I'm on the wrong track altogether. So that's what I'll be doing next. You can see here that this solution is looking pretty promising. I did have a slight moment of panic where I saw that while the rear pogo pin issue had been fixed, I thought for a second like, oh, maybe I have fixed that problem and it has emphasized this underlying problem, which is that the vertical pogo pins aren't always maintaining their connections. But I was able to fix this issue just by tightening the wheels on that side of the carriage. And so everything was working perfectly now. I can move the lamp around freely and I never lose power. Related to that, one thing that I want to improve in the future is to make this whole thing just a little bit more bulletproof. There's a little bit of tedium involved in setting up the carriage and mounting the pogo pins and making sure they're properly aligned. And I want to eliminate that and just make it really bulletproof, make it really easy to set up and very hard to mess it up. So I'll be looking into ways to improve that in the future. Outside of those little optimizations, the solution is looking really good. I can move the lamp around into all of its positions positions and it's actually kind of hard to get it to disengage from power and to reboot even in like the really awkward scenarios like where the arm is fully extended um, it does sometimes reboot like it just did but that's because it's just shorting out on the pins at the very end so I'll have to fix that it's been really nice over the past couple weeks I've just been like really in the zone creatively maybe going to open sauce was a bit of an inspiration but I've been working on the DIY stuff a lot and I've just been doing like little optimizations and updates and improvements here and there but they don't really like flow together into a narrative. So I figured there must be a good way to like string them all together and share them with you in a short amount of time.
Inside the LED cover, there's a temporary solution I've been meaning to address. What I'm calling the heat pipe sandwich comprises three parts. This copper bracket, the heat pipe, and a strip of random scrap brass that all could use a bit of cleaning up. I want to replace this top piece of bread with something more polished and precise, and while I'm at it, replace the bottom piece of bread with something that blocks the light from leaking through. I have three top piece variations to test. A copper version with threaded holes, an identical aluminum variant, and an aluminum variant with embedded threaded hardware. I love the look and extra thread length of the third option, so I'm gonna try this first. I'm using this spongy metal material to fill the gap between the heat pipe and the new holder, and I'm using these three millimeter spacers so there's just enough room for the heat pipe to fit snugly. It's starting to look like a real sandwich in here, but with the PCB in place, the top of the sandwich is almost touching the LED driver. So I ended up swapping this bracket out for the basic threaded aluminum version. And now we have a much more polished looking sandwich with better clearance. Next up, there's a new addition to the testing breadboard, an analog temperature sensor. I wanna make sure that the ambient temperature inside the 3D printed LED housing stays safely below the material's glass transition temperature, which is the temperature where the material softens and can deform. The ballpark I've found for PLA is 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, so to be safe, I'm setting the temperature limit at 48 degrees Celsius. If a temperature ever hits that limit, the lamp will shut off, and there's a second threshold just a few degrees below that, which activates a low power state to hopefully cool things down and prevent a full shutdown. These numbers are pretty rough right now, but I'm gonna do some testing and I'll refine them later. Finally, I made some code updates to improve modularity and legibility. Where before I was using a bunch of name functions for every feature, I now have functionality split between functions and classes. I use classes to manage different forms and units of brightness from the ambient brightness sensor and the LED output, and then functions for executing things like brightness changes. One of the benefits here, outside of just getting some experience working with Python classes, is that it has made the main loop a lot simpler. You may have noticed that I've taken some weird space saving measures like declaring multiple variables in one line like this. That's because after adding auto brightness and now this new temperature sensor, I've hit the storage limit on my Cutie Pie. I'm going to look into switching to something with a bit more on board storage that still runs CircuitPython and also has built-in USB support. And those are all the updates I have for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next build log.